Friends, welcome back to our final morning of Cardus' 20th birthday celebration. It's been a wonderful and packed schedule on Thursday and Friday. And we're gonna go out with a bang this morning. Today, we'll have two final panels. First, we're gonna go live to Ottawa for a panel entitled, This Cultural Moment, featuring Trinity Forum President, Cherie Harder, our own editor-in-chief of Comment Magazine, Ann Snyder, being interviewed by Ray Pennings and Joanna Van Hoff, Cardus staff. We hope you enjoy it. I thought the best way to start was just give you a sense of what we were hoping to achieve when we were thinking of this panel and where it fit in. And, um, you know, Michael mentioned in his speech last night the importance of listening. And clearly for Cardis to be doing its job effectively, we need to read the culture well. We need to understand what is our cultural moment. We need to understand what are, where are the opportunities. There is a federal government and a bureaucracy with literally tens, actually I suspect hundreds of thousands of people whose full-time job it is to work on all the different areas of public policy and there's absolutely no way we can compete, fill in all the blanks, comment, stay on top of all of that. So an important part of our work in terms of impact is understanding well where are the opportunities and to actually be prepared and do our work on tomorrow's issues not yesterday's and um, right from the beginning we've been fairly attentive to that so already i think in 2000 to 2003 we were only at this for a couple of years we were spending upwards of 25 percent of our budget on comment magazine Comment Magazine, right from the beginning, has been a place where, uh, and a lot of people have said to, to me, why, as Cardis, are you publishing a thought journal? That's not the usual stuff of think tanks. That's a separate niche altogether. For us, Comment Magazine has been to have a edit separate editorial process from the leadership of Cardis that is aligned, obviously, but... The challenge to comment, when I hired Jamie Smith to be the editor of Comment in 2012, I recall specifically there were various concerns and I said, I will never ask you about the number of people who read Comment magazine. As editor, you're not gonna have to worry about a single set of the numbers. I'm the publisher, I'll worry about that. And if they're not okay, that's my fault, not yours. What I want you to do is to have a conversation on the pages of Comment magazine that is going to challenge Cardis to think Christianly about the issues of the day. You're to bring the best writers, the best thinkers from an Apostles' Creed, Ecumenical Creed, Orthodox, but I don't want them all saying the same thing. I want to hear the range of opinion of thoughtful Christians across North America, and you're going to go find the best. You're going to put those articles on the pages of Comment Magazine, and your audience is Cardis. And we'll let the rest of the world, we'll publish it so the rest of the world can eavesdrop on our conversation. Ann Snyder, who's on the panel this morning, became the editor of Comment Magazine in 2019, just pre-COVID. And I recall sitting in a Washington um, coffee shop interviewing Ann and uh, having a very similar sort of conversation. I had and no however, idea he was interviewing me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I came completely underdressed for what turned out to be my future job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to tell her in advance what you were thinking. You just said, can we have a meeting, right? So, um, but one of the things as we went through the process is that Anne highlighted the fact that she was interested in more than just comment um, and Curtis as an audience. There was an opportunity, a cult, in terms of reading the cultural moment, a magazine, there used to be a magazine called Books and Culture, it had disappeared. First Things Magazine has morphed very much from what it used to be. Um, I won't go through all the, the Christian thought magazines that exist in North America, but there was an identifiable vacuum. And so we are in the midst right now with Comment Magazine of not only speaking to Cardis, although that remains the primary purpose of Comment Magazine, but also of building a learning community of leaders from right across Christian organizations across North America. And if you're not familiar with Comment Magazine, I am the publisher, so I would be remiss if at a session like this, I did not, if I did not highlight the fact that we have a beautiful magazine that comes out in print four times a year, there are some sample copies laying around. It does take a subscription to get this 
physical copy in your hand, but there is something about the physical copy sitting beside your uh, chair and reading these articles, mulling over, going back. Um, you should subscribe. Uh, they are all available online, and there's a weekly essay online, a whole bunch of other things. So all of that to say when we were thinking about this session, we thought, why don't we take a session and share a bit about our read of the moment? And a part of our growth of Comet Magazine has also been um, a partnership. And I see that on the screen here, Cherie has joined us. Uh, Cherie Harder is a Cardiff Senior Fellow, a longtime friend, and as of October the 18th, we are formal partners with the Trinity Forum in Washington, D.C. Cherie heads the Trinity Forum, and they have been distinguished over the last number of years of holding very regular events at the Washington Press Club in which very much thinking about issues of faith and public life and interviewing the leading authors, the leading thinkers. And Cherie has um, built up a very significant and loyal audience. And um, then COVID came. They pivoted to online. And now their audience is thousands worldwide. I believe you're, if I overheard correctly last week, we, we had 34 at your, um, 34 countries represented at your event last week. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it is, every issue of Comet is going to be launched now with an event in partnership with Trinity Forum. And uh, we're just absolutely delighted about the partnership. So we have Anne and Cherie here. Um, Joanna Van Hoff, who's on my left, has recently joined Cardis. As part of all of this, we not only rely on Comet Magazine, we have a network of senior fellows, next gen staff and board. There's about 70 people totally. And we actually conduct a very formal survey in terms of saying what are the most important issues that Carter should be paying attention to and what are the 10 articles that you've read lately that we should really be paying attention to. Joanna is the one who reads every one of those, <laughs> summarizes all of them and creates a nice 12 page summary for all of us to have. So she knows this data inside out. I will say that I am, I have committed to reading every one of the links that one of our board and fellows, and I'm about two thirds of the way through. But um, it is literally hundreds of articles that our thoughtful leaders from right across the board are giving us. In many ways, that's how we use to build organizational intelligence to read the moment. And we're just gonna talk about some of that stuff here, here this morning. Let me just fill in, I've given you the organizational context. Let me just very quickly introduce, starting with Cherie. Cherie is, as I mentioned, the president of the Trinity Forum. Prior to that, she was a special assistant to President Bush. She was the director of public policy and projects for First Lady Laura Bush. She's been a policy advisor to Senate, uh, Senate Majority Leader in the US, a senior counselor for the National Endowment of Humanities. She has degrees from Harvard and from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. She comes to us this morning from Washington, D.C., where she lives with her husband, Chris. Then there is Ann Snyder. As I mentioned, in 2019, she became the editor-in-chief of Comment Magazine. Prior to that, she was working for the Philanthropy Roundtable in the United States. Um, in that capacity, she wrote a book, The Fabric of Character, 2019. And if you want to talk about organizational character as opposed to individual character, I know of no better book to recommend than Anne's uh, 2019 book, The Fabric of Character. She's been an editorial assistant in the New York Times, worked at other think tanks. Um, she comes to uh, she has degrees from Wheaton and Georgetown, and she comes to us from Washington, D.C. as well, although she's here in person, and uh, she lives there with her husband, David. And then Joanna Van Hoff, who just joined us in spring of this year somewhere. She is a senior researcher at Cardis. Johanna has a master's educational leadership degree from OISE as well as a degree from McMaster. She had a career in the educational sector and as I mentioned, just joined us as a primary researcher and she's the lead on this cultural intelligence work. And uh, she comes to us from Hamilton where she lives with her husband Ryan and several kids, but I forgot to mention or to ask specifically and I'm not gonna embarrass myself by saying the wrong number. So. That's our panel this morning. I'm going to, we have four topics. I don't expect to get through all four. I'm going to, my job was to set it up and to put these people on the road. 
Joanna is going to sort of summarize a little bit of our learnings from our most recent cultural intelligence survey, set it up with a question. Anne and Cherie are going to give us their wisdom, and I, if I see a lane that they're missing, I'm going to send them down that lane. But for the rest, of my job is to wrap this up at 1025. So Joanna, take it from here. Thank you, Ray. Um, I must say that uh, starting out my journey with CARDIS uh, with this task was a really wonderful way to get to know the organization. Um, if you uh, submitted a survey, I feel like I know you, <laughs> even though you haven't met me. Um, and uh, it was, it was yeah, really wonderful to be able to sort of see the breadth of expertise that um, that CARDIS is privy to and uh, is able to learn from. Um, the results of the survey that we sent out in June definitely covered a lot of ground. Um, we received many responses and um, there were many themes that came out of the survey. Um, one of the major themes in terms of our current cultural moment was um, a devaluation across the board of the human experience. And as a derivative of that, one thing that I think Ray and I both talked about that is perhaps um, not as visible in the current media discourse is the advancement of technology and artificial intelligence, particularly in areas um, of bioethics. And so some of our senior research fellows who are experts in that field really um, alerted us to advancements in, within the field of bioethics, things such as um, the artificial uh, development of sperm or ova that can create new, uh, new humans, um, advancements within artificial intelligence that can uh, lead to a, an extension of life or um, the, the idea that our memories can be preserved in technological ways uh, that before would never have been possible. And of course, these advances also offer, offer many um, enhancements to the human experience and contribute to human flourishing as well. And I know that uh, none of us here are experts in technology, but we are all human. And I think one of the uh, things that we wanted to talk about this morning is the underlying implication of some of these advances, which is as one fellow put it, um, the idea that the transfer from human to transhuman to posthuman is of little consequence. It's inevitable that technology will change our lives and has changed our lives in many ways. Um, but I know that uh, um, there is so much that we can talk about here. And Cherie, I know that you've had some really relevant conversations recently with some wonderful thinkers in the field regarding um, some of these issues. And I'm just wondering if you can share with us how do you see technology changing our ideas of what it means to be human and how is it influencing in expansive or reductive ways our conceptions of reality and relationship? Wow. Well, that is a big question. And first of all, I should just have just a real pleasure. Start you off with an easy one. It's only 20 to 10 on a Saturday morning. <laughs> well, thanks for that. That is a, a big question. I should just start off by saying it's a real pleasure to be uh, with you. I'm sorry I can't be with you all in person, which seems, um, I guess, especially ironic since we're talking, about, we'll probably be talking about embodiment. So I, I wish I could be there in person, but it's nice to, to join you even even this way. Um, yes, as uh, both Ray and Joanna mentioned, we have hosted a number of, we call them online conversations that usually happen on Fridays, where I get the pleasure of talking with a different Christian thought leader. And so we've we've kind of uh, tried to engage uh, that topic in, in a number of ways, both from you know, a direct conversation about transhumanism and um, the very uh, well, time immemorial temptation uh, to want to live without any limitations, uh, to transcend the boundaries of what it means to be an embodied person. Um, that was the original temptation, uh, of course, is to, to be like God. Um, and it's one that's playing out in all sorts of 
uh, interesting, at times seemingly you know, crazy ideas. We hear about different you know, tech bros you know, busy investing millions of dollars into finding ways to, to download their brains uh, once they uh, pass on or achieve the singularity or whatever it is. Um, but we've also tried to engage it from other ways. You know, most recently, uh, hosting Kate uh, Baller talking about her experience of suffering uh, and the limitations of being human that confront us, uh, even when we uh, when we may not want them to. So, I do think, as you um, indicated, that this is this is one of the really big issues that does face us. You know, what what does it mean to be human? What limitations? Um, are there and are actually you know, good for us. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll just point out as well, which may be a little bit um, tangential or um, you know, kind of a per- peripheral, but I think is also sort of relevant is um, you know, we, you know, how we spend our days, of course, this is an Andy Diller quote, is how we spend our lives. And we are, um, all of us as a people, increasingly spending our time in sort of non-embodied ways. Um, you know, it has been a long trend coming that more and more time is spent on the virtual um, with electronic media, with social media in particular, uh, with, you know, virtual ways of engaging. And that's been going on. I mean, the, the, uh, the increase has just been extraordinary. That's been going on even as the time spent on work increases, and especially for kind of um, upper income uh, people. Uh, but what is squeezed out is uh, our, our embodied practices. It's time spent sleeping, exercising, socializing in person, you know, and reading. Um, and so even beyond the really kind of um, attention grabbing sort of extreme uh, temptations to try to download our brain or uh, become a brain donor, uh, just in general, we as uh, a people, as well as we as individuals, are spending more of our more of our time um, and thus our lives essentially engaged in the virtual uh, in the non embodied, and I think that will have implications for how we see the uh, the increasing temptations of transhumanism to be as gods um, as not that big of a deal because we are essentially kind of already engaging in some of the practices that essentially grease the skids. Moment, and I'm thinking of the conversation you had with philosopher Richard Mao and um, the inventor from the University of Michigan about a month or so ago. There were in that conversation, um, you highlighted very much the difference. Be, you know, on the one hand, artificial intelligence isn't really the na- an accurate name for what it is. It is actually complex information processing and it's rational cognitive information. And I think the examples that were used there are the difference of play. A computer can play chess, but it can't have the satisfaction of winning. Um, And um, can you you expand on that in terms of the the limit, even the things that we do with artificial, how it isn't as fully human and it, it narrows us a little bit? I thought there were some very important points that you've highlighted in some of that work. Oh, that's a great question, Ray. And you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of what you know, artificial intelligence is, you know, is exactly that. It is, it is binary. Uh, it's you know, information systems. It's run by algorithms. Uh, there is um, you know, a, a very mechanistic aspect to it. You know, and of course, part of um, the most delightful, uh, even delicious ways of being human do involve playing and imagination and wonder. Um, it, it's entering into something that is beyond oneself, um, that, is, uh, that is social, that is um, unexpected, that is non-programmable in a sense, um, that arises from a sense of both delight and discovery uh, and interaction. Um, you know, or encounter with with others or with the other. Uh, and that's part of, I think, the joy of, of being human um, and being human as being created in the image of God. There is something that is, of course, inherently relational to that, um, you know, reflecting the Trinity that is not mirrored in the same way 
in the more mechanistic, data-driven, algorithm-driven, um, you know, kind of artificial intelligence initiatives and the like that um, that we're increasingly seeing. And can I um, shift over to you on this? Because not only is the experiential things that, uh, you know, the wonder, the awe, and that, there's also ethical dimensions in terms of the choices that we allow artificial intelligence to make. I'm thinking, for instance, of a drone. Um, it's one thing to have a soldier decide to pull a trigger um, in the context of war. It's quite another to have an algorithm figure out exactly and drop bombs on people and have all the rest. Can you reflect a little bit in terms of this whole artificial intelligence embodiment and the whole ethical decision-making experiential elements of this and how, you know, senses of right and wrong? When, when you think of those questions, what are the questions you ask? What are, I'm not expect, you know, obviously you probably need a thesis to, um, to answer the question, but when you think of these, what are some of the key questions we need to be asking ourselves as we think of this stuff? Well, Ray, I haven't commissioned a comment issue on artificial intelligence yet, so I don't really know much about it. <laughs> uh, part of my job, I say, is um, having a major curiosity in the morning and then asking a lot of people much smarter than me to populate an issue so that I get to learn. Um, and I should, can I just say a tiny bit of sincerity here? It is a true joy to be here. Comment has been like one of the great vocational joys of my life. And Cherie is a long time mentor, exemplar, turned friend, now turned partner. So this is kind of a fun, all things coming together. Um, you know, when I think of technology, AI, the human person, and sort of if I were to put them in a visual graph and your question around ethical choices, um, the richness of moral sentiments to me is like part of, is like the core, or is a piece of the core of what it means to be human. And technology and AI, for however brilliant AI in particular is going to become in the algorithms, in sort of mirroring our instincts or our correlative, uh, sort of the correlative chemistry of our decision making. It can't fundamentally, I don't think it'll ever be fundamentally able to answer questions of why and what for. Um, and that, I mean, I could be wrong about that, but um, I think there's something in that, in, in questions of T loss that is part of the God image in us um, that I think I worry about with us outsourcing major decisions that you talk about drones of life and death to, to you know, to a technological device. Um, and I just want to pick up on something Cherie said. Um, you know, when I think about, I think a lot about institutions, as Ray mentioned, the fabric of them, the character of them. And when I think about sort of, or as I have observed, the rise in technology affect all of us and of course we are deeply affected as individuals by the institutions we're a part of but as we change in response to forces in our lives and technology is a huge one the institutions change as well and there just seems to be I just wanted to mention a couple things that she triggered as she was talking one is um, there's something going on today, and then I'm mostly going to blame these little devices that we have always in our pockets, where we just don't seem to need each other. We don't feel a felt need for one another as much. You know, if I'm preparing for Thanksgiving, which in the States I will be in a week, um, I don't actually need to call my grandmother or knock on a neighbor's door to ask how to baste a turkey. I can just figure that out by Googling it. Um, you know, the sort of endless entertainment over time, like slowly but surely starts to erode a felt need for the pesky inconveniences of relationship. Um, the sort of water cooler conversations you would have in an office and the natural frictions that lead to creativity um, are all just kind of, there. we are entering into this I think era where we want to control everything and we want to have, or we think we want to have, like constant optionality. And those dynamics, um, as they intersect with how we think about institutional life, just sort of, I think, flatten um, the goods that are so inherent to institutions properly understood that should have some like level of accountability and surrender and submission, um, trust, formation. Uh, so there's there's something here I think that worries me a little bit as I think about. So let me take your worry and um, turn quote your own words of well, that we're a little more positive okay. as well. Yeah. Um, along the way. And, but but no, and I actually think they complement each other uh, well. You in your in the editorial on the summer issue of Embodiment, 
you talked about how um, our time at home over the last couple of years have actually reintroduced us to taste and smell and sing and laugh and do some of these things um, that we have been forced to a more embodied existence and there is something redeeming about all of the rest that you know sort of out of this cultural moment in terms of the post covid we may may be learning how deeply are those lessons learned will it last can it overcome can you just pick up on the theme of that editorial and yeah. some of because the rest of the rest of the issue of comment didn't necessarily fully reflect all that optimism so just to share a little bit on that I think sometimes I overpromise hope and then we underdeliver on the hope and we give a lot of diagnosis. Um, I think the question of whether it will endure is right now very much a question of human will. And there will be some people who allow the lessons of this pandemic and so far as those of us who were fortunate to stay healthy and we enjoyed the um, wholesome reminders of what it is to get to curl around a fire and play Scrabble every night with your loved ones instead of going out to this, that and the other. Um, to enter into the deep permanence of small circle of relationship instead of uh, living constantly multi-context lives and other things that I think of as good, certainly things that I learned. Um, you know, my husband and I made a vow about September of last year, when this pandemic is over, um, we're gonna have such a large yes that precludes all of the other yeses, and we're gonna have this very single-minded life, and we're just gonna say no to all these things. And then as the world has opened up, and two-way streets are more complicated than our one-way resolutions, um, that has just not been the case at all, and it's been probably the most intense and uh, sort of fractured fall that I can remember in a long time, unfortunately. So I'm humbled by the forces that come upon us. Um, but I do think, you know, I, for some years now, um, as I have found myself studying institutions, I lived in Houston, Texas for quite a long time where I was living in immigrant communities and sort of studying their dy dynamics of assimilation and sort of traditional moral values with modernity and with American values. I, and then I would hear like peers who I had gone to college with or high school with who were in Silicon Valley, and this is about six, seven years ago, describe the venture capital deals they were making and the hopes they had for technology to save the world. And I felt, even then, something is getting detached here from the way most people live. Like, the people who are at the who are the kingmakers of our technological universe are speaking in a way that is ignoring the fact that at the end of the day we have these bodies that are limited literally in space like I'm here I'm not over there um, limited in capacity require rhythms of work rest and play and somehow just like the 101 basics of human joy seem to be um, uh, just either taken for granted or not woven in to how people are creating um, the devices, the programs that are increasingly running our lives. And so that, I it just, I don't have an answer per se, but I think some, there's hope in so far as many of us have been, I think, awakened to the gift of um, embodied joys, but also the gift of our own limits, as Cherie said, and I'm just very curious to know those who are in positions of creating things um, that, that lead to, you know, deep shifts in our habits as human beings, how will they weave in a logic of limits and see it as a good and not something to just constantly overcome in the name of enlightenment or human progress? Great. Um, the clock is one of these forces, and I Speaking just realized the fact that we are about halfway through our time. I have four themes that we were going to cover, and we've covered one. So we are going to just as a, um, a cue to my panelists, I'm going to let's jump to, th to theme three, the polarization ideologies. And Joanna, do you want to pick that one up? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so polarization and ideology is something that we've heard about already, I think, over the last couple of days. Um, it was definitely a uh, concern um, that was put forward by our senior fellows in the intelligence survey. And um, it came out in multiple ways. Some of the respondents ad addressed um, that concern directly. Uh, and talked about the state of public discourse, um, 
that that is very discouraging. They talked about the fact that many people today are prone to live in echo chambers of ideology and that this is really not conducive to building shared spaces of dialogue and others shared concern for the weakening of democracy through the rise of populism on the one hand or the um, identity politics on the other. And many responses also dealt with the outcomes of polarization um, and the existence within these ideological silos that we have. Um, some of those outcomes include the, a decline uh, and a concern for freedom of speech or academic freedom um, cancel culture, a general inability, it seems, to debate difficult issues, and an allergy toward consideration or um, um, of difference and to, for one another. And as well, educational respondents really talked about a decline that they were observed in critical thinking skills and in genuine curiosity, as I think you also just touched on, Anne. Um, and so I think if we think about also the most recent issue of comment that you've produced, and uh, the title was Beyond Ideology, and it really showcased writing and thinking that asked and encouraged us to move beyond these frameworks that polarize and distance us from one another. And um, I've only been with Cardis three months now, but it's only taken a few conversations with you to really recognize, I think, a beautiful burden that God has laid on your heart towards an ethic of hospitality. Um, so I, I'd love to ask you specifically, Anne, how can Christians encourage our culture to move beyond this us versus them mentality? And what are the key ingredients uh, for building a framework of hope and hospitality and common ground? It's a beautiful question, thanks, Joanna. Um, it kind of gets back to the first question, what is the human person? And I do think, um, you know, to some degree, ideology can be helpful. It's, it, you know, I think in the 90s, 2000s, there was a, a, a lot of people in certain quadrants of the Christian world who were very, you know, love this world wor word worldview. And ideology and worldview are different. We could have that conversation another day. But ideologies are shortcuts to value. You know, I think that's how I typically, my positive definition of it, that's how I understand the moral map of what someone is emphasizing as their priorities. And of course, this plays out in our politics. Um, but I think there's something about the human person and seeing if you believe and are able to see. I actually think you can, I know people who are atheists who still, who are trying to be healthy contributors to the common good, who actually acknowledge something about the fact that we each have a soul. There's something that is of no weight or size or boundary or shape that like gives us some kind of eternal evanescent um, dignity and value. And that leads to a philosophy that is more enshrined in sort of Catholic social teaching than Protestant, but personalism and this idea that persons are end in, ends in and of themselves. Um, and I just think there's something that, about that tied to, and I'm going to say something a little controversial here, um, about when you ask, like, what is, how do we get to more of a framework of hope and hospitality and common ground? I am tempted to say I would love to encourage more and more people, myself included, to begin with questions of reality, like what is reality versus values. Um, this is something I, I don't know if I'm totally correct on this, but instead of imposing always a set of shoulds or a utopic set of goods on what we, you know, the good societies, we should first begin with. Um, I don't know, this is the journalist in me speaking, but what do you see right in front of you? And um, you know, I happened to have a conversation uh, two weeks ago with someone, I was in uh, Waco, Texas, and uh, the woman in my car, we had this like lovely conversation about all aspects of life, and then sort of politics came up in the last five minutes, and turns out she's like deeply, deeply suspicious of the vaccine. Um, and in a way that was sort of quite conspiratorial about the government's desire to inject us with GMOs and depurify our humanity and take away our Bill of Rights. And, and so I was just listening and I was learning so much and then we got to this point where I didn't totally agree with her, her theory and her great fear, but I could empathize with the distrust. Um, and I just said, because I didn't quite know what else to say, because I, I, 
yeah, I, I just did, so I just said, these are such complicated times, ma'am, aren't they? And she said, oh, you're telling me, ma'am, these are very complicated times. And we wound up having this hug at the end. And um, that sounds very glib and naive, and obviously our politics can't, you know, um, survive on saying it's complicated. But um, I think there's something about attending to um, never making a human being feel less than human that is is like just fundamental to moving past. Sure, can I segue from what Anne has just said, um, and we both, and uh, in terms of her personal warmth, and, that, and there is certainly when we come, a, there's something very personal, but there's also something institutional about it. And I want to ask you, um, you know, you're speaking to a group of Canadians here, but we look at your resume, you spent time in the White House, you, you, you have Harvard, White House, the elite institutions of our society on um, on your resume. Talk about the, you know, Anne said, we have to start with reality as opposed to values. And in many ways, even as a think tank, I think this very listening exercise isn't, you know, I, one of the reasons we do the cultural intelligence thing is to get a broader input in terms of what's the reality of the, of the issues on the front line. Let's listen to the questions our neighbors are asking as opposed to imposing an agenda that we have predetermined. Can you just, I, I won't turn that into a precise question, but can you pick up on that from the perspective also of your own experience in elite institutions? No, oh, absolutely. Thanks, Ray. And one thing I, I should say is I am um, just such a, a big fan of what Comment is doing and um, of certainly the, the vision that Anne brings to it as well. And just, you know, one thing I'll say very personally is one of the articles that Anne commissioned for me would not have thought to do it without, um, with, you know, without her encouragement was to actually write about intellectual hospitality uh, and what that means and how it can be cultivated. And I'll say more about that uh, in a second. But, you know, one of the things I just really appreciate is how both uh, Anne and comment really embodies um, the, the helos and the vision for which they aim. And so um, there's so many reasons why we're really delighted to be partnering uh, with comment, but certainly that is, is one of the many reasons. Um, you know, part of our discussion before, I think, does naturally kind of lend itself to, to that question. Um, you know, as we have got gotten more and more online, uh, that has certainly been a factor, not only with our polarization that you talked about, but also with, in some ways, um, our increasingly sort of tenuous um, relationship with, with reality. Uh, you know, it's interesting to, to know that the more time we spend online, the less likely we are to do things like uh, give, tithe, volunteer, know our neighbors, um, whereas actually those uh, all those kind of very embodied and engaged kind of activities are positively correlated with time spent reading, even as they're negatively correlated with, with the electronic. Um, however, more time does tend to uh, essentially kind of increase our likelihood of feeling quite polarized and, and quite extreme. Our, our algorithms essentially allow uh, entertainment and media companies to profit off the currency of our increased attention by feeding us what essentially reinforces our opinions, our biases, and our grievances, which is a great way to essentially ensure that we are ever more polarized. Uh, and the more polarized we are, uh, there is a big link between that and our confusion about or disagreement, not only about what is uh, good or bad, better or worse in terms of a policy sense, uh, but true or false, real or unreal. And so one of the things you see now is the more time that people spend uh, in their own echo, ch echo chambers, the more likely they are uh, to, to um, basically affirm all or part of different conspiracy theories uh, and the like, and to, you know, essentially have one's idea of what's what's real affected by the echo chamber around them, and, and that is a, a real challenge. It's one that I think is a very worthy one for common uh, to take up. You know, in the past, uh, pluralism has helped us essentially live across, uh, live peacefully across differences of, you know, good or bad, uh, but living as a people deeply divided about what is real or unreal is, is a new challenge. Um, 
you know, for us. And so I think really digging into that is, is really important. You know, as Anne was saying, part of what tethers us uh, to reality uh, is embodied interaction. You know, it's, it's the kind of engagements that she was talking about with her her friend and what was it, the cab um, uh, who believes in crazy conspiracy theories. I mean, I bet that that woman essentially felt uh, just felt the sweetness of connection with Anne, even if all they could agree upon on the end was that life is complicated. There is something about embodied human connection, I think, that um, that grounds us in reality uh, and orients us towards uh, towards reality and towards wisdom. You know, if we're going to define wisdom as essentially rightly discerning uh, and responding to reality. Uh, okay. That's... Can yeah, I just really, jump in on that, Cherie? Um, in terms of the connection between wisdom, um, one of the one of the projects you have at the Trinity Forum is taking great books and um, you know writing thirty to forty page summaries of them and making them very current in terms of the readings. And as you were talking about, the more time we spend online, um, you know, it just reminds me. And you know, I know I find them very valuable, um, reminding me of some of the books I read but have forgotten the main themes of, and giving me a very quick way in an hour or two to read a book that I hadn't read previously but ought to have um, along the way. What strikes me is the core of that, obviously, is the sense that reality and wisdom isn't just to be found on the Internet or in terms of day-to-day. -day. Reality and wisdom is shaped by those who came before us. We are inheritors of a certain reality, and we can't understand our present without understanding some of those frameworks that have come before us. Can you, I'm, I, I've never heard you articulate exactly why you do the books in, in the way I'm, I'm making some assumptions there, but is that at all in line? And, and can you just pick up on that theme? Well, it's absolutely in line, Ray. Um, so yes, you, you nailed it. Uh, and uh, one thing I'll say sort of beyond that, we have a hundred different titles now, and it's really a range of uh, essays, short stories, poetry, um, a, a lot of literature, um, uh, even a libretto handles Messiah. Uh, and we very deliberately uh, choose a lot of stories as opposed to just essays or propositions. And part of the reason we do that, of course, is that it you know, engages right brain as well as left brain, that there's something about stories uh, that essentially invites us to think differently. It invites different ways uh, of apprehending um, what is real that in some ways lend themselves even more to the sort of imaginative play and delight uh, that Anne was talking about earlier. You know, when we are confronted with arguments or propositions, we tend to kind of jump into kind of left brain uh, analytical mode. Do I agree or disagree? Why or why not? Is this valid or isn't it? And part of what stories do, and um, especially great literature that has stood the test of time and that raises big questions that are um, the timeless as well as um, eternally timely, is it, um, it encourages us to kind of think differently to, you know, kind of undergo the empathetic exercise of putting ourselves in the place of characters and thinking with them about the dilemmas that they find themselves in and um, how to respond and how to understand them. And, and there's something about it that is, is deeply stretching, um, I think, to the mind, but also to the heart and soul. Um, one of our online conversation speakers that we hosted recently, who is also, I believe, uh, a senior fellow and on the editorial board of the comment is Alan Jacobs. And he talks about this quite a bit, uh, about how engaging with old books actually increases the density of your soul. Uh, so part of why we, uh, we publish our quarterly readings uh, is to, as you were saying, better uh, acquaint our readers with the best of literature and letters across the century. But not just acquaint them uh, with that literature, but you know, in hopes along the lines of what Alan Jacobs has talked about, that this will be um, formational, not just informational, but this will actually expand um, their outlook and 
perhaps even uh, strengthen and thicken their soul. And picking up on that, um, you know, you, you're editing a magazine, which is words on paper and um, digitally. But, um, you know, this week we launched uh, Greg Thompson's, um, you know, uh, column in terms of, of, of food. Um, every issue of the magazine comes with a bookmark that has a recipe on one side and a playlist on the other. Um, and let me just, uh, you know, maybe, and I'll, I'll just share this um, well, it was middle of October, um, Anna and her husband hosted 11 of us for a dinner, and several of us were meeting for the first time. We didn't know each other that well, and it was amazing how simply the question that emerged there ended up in some people bearing their souls in pretty remarkable ways. Um, <laughs> Content that's all, that's a on one hand in terms of facilitating, but I think there's something more to that. And you know, do you want to just elaborate on why why you're why you're introducing this to comment? And yeah. It speaks directly to this point. In some ways, I think I'm taking a page from the Trinity Forum readings. I think that was in my head when the comment suppers, uh, which has been there from the beginning of my time a couple years ago. These bookmarks that encourage you to host discussions. Um, and then this new thing that Greg is doing for us, the welcome table, which is sort of a history of food and the power of the table. Uh, specifically, we're kind of gearing it towards uh, relations in the U.S., but it has been this place of hard but, but very worthy sort of pathway to rise reconciliation. Um, and we're going to try to of embody that welcome table more and more in the coming year with some experiments off the page. But I was very touched yesterday. I spoke with a group of our Cardis Gen Fellows, and one of the young men just noted, and I don't know if he's here, but um, the comment seems to be so relationally intentional. And he, he asked a very eloquent question about that. But I was, it was like the best thing you could have said to me um, because I really do view this particular publication as necessarily weaving, weaving authors together, weaving doers and thinkers together, weaving readers together, ideally in their place where they live and work. Um, and I, I think I have approached it that way in part because I'm a Christian and I believe we are whole and we are integrated <laughs> and we are embodied, in part because I did study formation and specifically moral and spiritual formation for quite a few years and became convinced that some, in such a pluralistic age where um, there are so many different truths and moral paradigms out there for us to choose from and there's so much distrust in authority and institutions, this sort of just, and we're so deluged with content on a daily basis, that just having articles by your side, and I really believe in deep reading as a way to get past ideology, but even just books on their own, in our time, the way our brains are being so overwhelmed, none of that gets really remembered, or it doesn't sink 18 inches down to the, you know, geography of the heart where you actually start shifting your behavior. You, you know, ideally, when I read something, I want to submit to it a little bit, and I want to be changed. Um, not to become a totally different person, but to be formed. Um, and I find I'm much more likely to do that in my hands than online, and I'm much more likely to do that if I get to discuss it with someone, ideally in a hospitable setting. So I just think the links that we've historically had between something in text that changes us are broken because of a lot of the other sort of pathologies in our culture these days, or, or losses, I should say, more than pathologies. Um, and there's, there's just something about trying to reinvigorate a more holistic um, uh, approach to ideas, ideas that can actually change the world and certainly change you, and that happens in the in-between with another human being. Cherie, just picking up on this notion of formation and, you know, speaking yesterday to a next gen, and usually when we talk about formation, we think of younger people being formed towards their positions of leadership. You're in a position where you're interacting with current leaders, some at the very highest level. Can you talk about the process of formation while you are a leader and growing information on that? And there, because that brings a particular vulnerability. A leader in that position has an organizational reputation to um, protect, can't be ordinarily as vulnerable 
Um, there are many in this room who are leaders of significant organizations. I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit about the process uh, and the discipline of continually being formed as a leader. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Ray. And, you know, part of what forms us, of course, are, you know, factors that are probably fairly intuitive when we think about them. There are, they are our habits. Uh, what we repeatedly do. Uh, it involves attention, what we focus on. It involves what we love, um, our, our loves and priorities, um, what Augustine called the Ordo Amorum, um, what former comment editor Jamie Smith wrote about, and you are what you love. Um, you know, these things help shape our lives. Uh, left to drift in a cultural current without notice or intentionality, uh, how we, what we do with our, our time, our attention, our resources, and our priorities will almost always drag us where we do not want to go. Um, you know, one thing about a strong current, and we certainly are living in times with a very strong cultural current, you have to exist, uh, exert a fair amount of effort to even stay in place, um, you know, otherwise you, you will drift. And so I think part of what the challenge for um, not just young people, but as you indicated, leaders is, is understanding uh, the forces that pull them in a direction they may not want to go. And uh, kind of intentional exercise of, of, of those largely spiritual disciplines um, that take one in a different direction. But beyond even just the, the individual um, kind of factors of attention and habit and prioritization and our loves, uh, there are also kind of larger, I think, communal factors that play into formation. Uh, one of those is something that's been touched on recently, but, but institutions um, and relationships. And of course, those are, are connected. Institutions are often institutions and organizations, the trellis on which uh, relationship and community grows. Um, and you know, their decline has, I think, real implications, uh, not just for communities, but, but also for individual formation. So one of the first things we, we talk about is even just awareness of, of how we are being formed, uh, you know, even and perhaps even especially as adults, uh, because so much happens to us that can form us um, without necessarily our knowledge, consent, or even our notice. And so taking notice is really the first thing um, and the process of participating in, in, in one's own formation is often a, a deeply joyful exercise. You know, as Anne was talking about in submitting oneself to a great book, um, which is an intentional decision to give time and attention and effort and uh, the intellectual and emotional as, as well as spiritual exercise of of empathy and engagement, uh, one lead, leaves a great book changed. Uh, friendships, relationships change us, uh, and they all take time. So it's those kind of decisions that we, we focus on a lot for, for leaders. We have three minutes left, um, and Cherie is, if you, if you want to know how to moderate, watch somebody excellently moderate a panel, watch one of the online, I, I feel a little intimidated today because Cherie's one, Cherie is one of my favorite moderators, and when she wraps up, she always gives her panelists a warning that they are going to have to, in 45 seconds, summarize the message that they're going to want to leave with the audience. So, panelists, you now have your Cherie warning of the 45-second um, um, last word that you're all going to get. I just want to uh, just share, as I said, the, the, the thought behind putting this panel together was to share with you a little bit of how... Cardish tries to read the culture, not just in a random sort of way, but with institutional discipline and formation um, in terms of collecting the questions. And uh, we just touched the surface on two of the 12 themes that Joanna has summarized for us. Um, there's, there's lots to talk about. Anna, um, Anna and I next weekend are going to be in Texas talking about a whole bunch of these with 22 organizational leaders um, as well. This is a regular part of what we do and um, as much as we can put the research on a billboard and sort of summarize the research findings this is a little harder to demonstrate but i would argue is every bit as much important 
of the work of CARDIS in terms of what we're seeking to do. And for that, we're indebted to our senior fellows, of which Sharia is one, to Comment Magazine, of which Anne is um, primarily in charge, and to gathering all of this information and putting it in some coherent way in which Joanna is um, in charge as well, which is uh, why the three of them were chosen for the panel this morning. So with that um, advertisement, I'm going to give the last word to our panelists. Joanna, why don't we start with you in 45 seconds? Um, what, what is it out of all of this conversation that you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, um, the educator in me was really intrigued by um, just some of the conversation around hospitality and um, relational understandings of formation. Um, and so uh, I think I'm going to sit with that for a little while and just to encourage, I think, myself and everyone in this room to really approach our relationships with that intentionality, um, that this is a process of formation that we can undergo, and to seek out, the, to know that our institutions often connect us with people that we would think very differently from. You know, classrooms are full of students who grow up in very different circumstances and who um, have to learn to live with one another for, for the duration of a school year. Um, and the same is true for churches and, and all of the places. Even Cardis. Even Cardis, yes, although I do feel like it's a homecoming. Um, but uh, yeah, so how can we make those spaces hospitable is something that I will um, take away. Great. Yeah. This may be a little bit niche from this whole conversation, but your question, which I really appreciated, the what are the key ingredients to getting beyond ideology? And so that's specific to this question. I just three thoughts, um, maybe two, three. Uh, one is um, never let an, and relate to attention. So the, the umbrella is attention, and then it's two things. Um, never make another human being feel inconvenient to you. And I'm preaching this as much to myself as to anyone else. And then the second thing is, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and it's sort of try to, not try, scrupulously avoid those groups or initiatives that are making, that are obsessed with making one issue or one group the enemy. Um, that is something that is guiding me right now because I think we're seeing that in everywhere um, and sorry to end on a negative but I just as a slightly more concrete tip Sheree. yes uh, I'll also kind of circle back to, to hospitality and try to end on a, a thank you Sheree. A positive, a positive note um, just to affirm the the focus of the vision of, of comment and Cardis and say that we often think of hospitality as something minor, trivial, entertainment oriented, but as modest as it is, in many ways it pushes back against exactly what we have been talking uh, about here. The sense of being disembodied, polarization, a lack of reality, um, a, a lack of connection. It addresses all of those things uh, in a way that I think is really quite powerful. Um, and culturally, I mean, countercultural, if but not at all culture warring, and would even suggest that uh, hospitality uh, may be completely insufficient to save the world, but the world would will never be saved without it. We um, are one minute over, but um, I trust you will um, join me in thanking these three ladies for their wonderful. <laughs> We have a, about five minutes. Um, and we've got another panel that's been going for the last hour. It's just going to continue. Uh, those guys have been talking. We're going to talk housing um, and housing's effect on, on our social architecture, that wonderful word. But in the meantime, why don't you grab some coffee? Uh, if you need to pay the rent on your coffee, you can do that as well. There's still food and drink there. Um, and we're going to be back here in about five minutes. So let's try to do that. Um, this, one's gonna be a, this one's going to be a good one. So five minutes. We'll see you soon. We're not quite done yet. Friends, we have one more panel. Affordable housing is a skyrocketing concern in Canada and elsewhere. 
and Cardis is paying attention to the developing needs and the underlying justice questions behind that. Here now is our final panel of Elevate. Let's talk housing. All right, I'm not going to give you much preamble because this panel here today has a lot to say. We are going to dive right into the housing conversation. Let's talk about the housing crisis. I would find it very difficult to find someone in this room who has not spoken about this recently. It's relevant, and as we look ahead, it's something that we're going to talk more and more about because there are so many circles that intersect with the spaces where we spend our lives and our time. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our fearful, not MC, now turned moderator, Brian Dykema. Thanks, Rachel. And I promise you I'm not going to cry on this panel. Thanks, Anne. I appreciate that. Um, it was deeply moving, and you just had to be there. Um, we have a really great panel. These guys are actually coming up on stage to continue the conversation they've been having for about the last hour. So you're just going to, you're going to just sort of, we're going to go right onto scene. Um, but before I do that, I'm, I'm going to introduce the, the folks that we have uh, here so that you know who they are and, and why they're on the panel. So to my immediate left is Ernest Lang. Uh, Ernest uh, is somebody that I actually met very recently and has actually become quite... Uh, he and I are simpatico in many ways, and so Ernest is a CEO of Promerida. It's a company that does a lot of real estate development, but it's not just simply real estate. He's also served as vice chair of the Union Gospel Mission in Vancouver and has done about 22 years of, of work on the, the Lower East Side and in, in yeah. downtown East Side in Vancouver. Um, and so his interest is not just in terms of building houses, making money, and so on, but actually the social nature of housing. And so, Ernest, it's you are an expert, and I'm really glad to have you on this panel, so thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm loath to hear the, the term expert applied to me. He's a thought leader. He's a thought leader. Everybody can groan at thought leader. Um, another, him. Pardon? Follow him on LinkedIn. Follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Jeffrey Nevin, a longtime friend. We've known each other for a long time. Jeff Nevin is the CEO of Indwell. Um, which is an organization that you will get to know, that you need to know, and that you need to support. Um, I think one of the most interesting, innovative, and effective organizations in this country. Um, and Jeff, I'm honored that you can be on this, uh, on this panel as well. Um, Michael Crook is our fellow who's just to the next there. Michael is a uh, uh, senior VP at Altus Group, so you're, you're catching a bit of a, a trend here. Altus Group uh, does appraisals and works a lot in, in real estate. Michael has been thinking about the, this issue both from a technical point of view but also from a theological point of view for quite some time. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us. And then um, on, the, on the end, coming to us from Montreal is uh, Graham Singh. Graham Singh is executive director of the Trinity Centers Foundation. They also are one of the more interesting, um, one of the more interesting organizations in this country, doing work with churches and, and looking at how that, the properties and the land that's, uh, that they have, that they have, which is substantial, we're gonna get into that, can be used for best social purposes. And I actually, this is an incredible panel. This is an incredible panel at, at, in any place, and I'm really glad that, that all four of you can be here. So with that said, let's get right into it. Michael, what is the nature of our housing problem? Give us the lay of the land. What's the problem? Why do we have this problem? Uh, all right. Uh, we're going to need more of these, I think, depending on how this goes. But uh, so... <laughs> Maybe we start I'm, with... I'm glad there's only one microphone. So. <laughs> we'll just shout. Okay. <laughs> um, so maybe just start with a couple of definitions, right? So when we talk about housing as a problem in Canada, we seem to have just had an election about it. People throw the word affordability around. Very often that's in the context of how much it costs to buy a home. Um, but what we want to, for this conversation, I think focus on is how much of the household budget goes to cover the cost of shelter. Yeah. And the, like, the center of that is at market rates. So whether you're renting or owning, if you go out into the market, you want to buy some shelter, how much of your income is going to that? That's like sort of the frame for affordability. And then there's a whole bunch of things that hang off of that because not everyone is in a position to pay market rates for housing, various forms of subsidy and support that's available on top of what's in the market. So where are we at? We do not have enough houses for all of the people who live in this country. And many of the houses we do have are not located where people want to be living. So 
in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we were really good at building lots of houses. And it was good for the economy, and it was good for social cohesion, and then we stopped. Um, so housing construction starts, the number of new units we start building, has been down from a high in the 1970s since the 1970s, with the exception of four months earlier this year. And then now we're back below that level. And we don't build houses because we've made it really hard to build houses. So zoning regimes have gotten more restrictive. Municipalities have layered on additional costs to the process of building new houses. And then we have, on top of all of that, introduced lots of points in the political process where you could say no to a particular development for lots of different reasons. Scotiabank research note from a couple of months ago threw out a number based on sort of how many units do we have relative to the population. We're, by that analysis, two million units short. The big investment proposals during the election, we're going to add not millions of new units on top of what we expect, but just hundreds of thousands of new units. So even if we did all of that, we'd still be millions of units short. So we just need more houses. We need to put them where people want to be. And it is in Q3 GDP, real estate has become a drag on economic growth for Canada. It's no longer helping us move forward. The share of the economy that's just trading real estate has gone from 6% of GDP to 12% of GDP in the last 15 years. That's not construction, that's not building more houses, that's just realtors buying and helping people buy and sell. So we've got a huge distortion in the housing market and we need to build more houses. How's that? That's great. <laughs> build more houses. Okay, so Ernest, um, you do a lot of building, but you, you've also got a unique perspective on, on this problem. So there are other countries that have pe more people in them and that yet they don't have this problem. So maybe you can share with us where have you seen other places in this world that actually deal with this problem instead of waiting 50 years and continuing to have the problem grow worse. Maybe you can share that with us. Sure. Um, I'm going to provide a bit of context because everybody has a bias or you know, a point of view that they bring to these kind of issues. Um, first thing I would say is I identify as an orphan. That is my primary identity. My father died when I was 10. In fact, the fundamentals of my business was based on a promise I made to my father before he died. And because of that, my office is on Seymour and Pender in downtown Vancouver. If I walk about 10 minutes east of my office, I will be in the heart of the downtown east side. And I will see people living and uh, in tents if they're lucky or on, simply on a cardboard box. I have always identified with those people as my tribe. But if I walk 10 minutes west, I will get to a building where there was a $13 million condo sold a few years ago. I also happen to be born in Singapore, where when Singapore was, and, and I'm getting to your exact question, when, Sing, when Singapore was, became an independent country, I think in 1964, 1965, it had the per capita income of Ghana, and the same per capita income of Ghana. When my family moved from Singapore in 1976, I was two years old, the per capita income in Singapore was $2,500 US dollars, okay? That same number in Canada was $7,500 per person. If you take into account the uh, appreciation of Singapore dollar versus the US dollar during the last 45 years since we moved here, and take into account the depreciation, depreciation of the Canadian dollar against the US dollar over the last 45 years, what has happened was Singaporeans used to have a 20% of the can average Canadian income in 1976 when we moved here to Canada. Today, their income exceeds Canadian income by 25%. So I'm touching on a number of different issues that are directly impact housing. And I see this 
it's very much an economic issue, but it's also very much a community and social issue. Fundamentally, you cannot have a thriving society if you don't have homes for your people, period. Now, so going to the Singapore model, Singapore recognizes recognized many years ago, because here's a country that sits on 730 square kilometers that currently houses 5.8, 5.7, 5.8 million people. More than 80% of Singaporeans live in a home that they own. And the kind of pictures and images that I see if I walk five or 10 minutes west from my office are simply non-existent in Singapore, okay? I live in Vancouver. Metro Vancouver has 2.5 million people sitting on, uh, what was the number? Of, I think it's 5,800 square kilometers. Long story short, there are almost nine times as many people in Singapore compared to Metro Vancouver, which is by reputation the most expensive, most land constrained market in this country. What has gone wrong? We're one of the largest countries, the largest land masses on this planet. We're purportedly, theoretically, a G7 nation. How can we have people perform bodily functions in alleyways and living on cardboard boxes and living in tents? So the, the models that I have studied to some degree around the world that work on a long-term sustainable basis do a bunch of things. Firstly, they differentiate between housing for people and housing as an asset class. So in Singapore, the government created a, uh, the, what we call the Housing Development Board and became the predominant developer of housing because these, uh, the, uh, the, the founding prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, said, look it, we have nothing, we have, not, we have no resources, we, we don't even have water, we have to pipe in water from Malaysia. The only way we can build an economy, a thriving economy, is to invest in our people. So we have to, people need homes, simple as that. How can you build a high value innovation economy if you have people living on, on cardboard boxes? or having to spend 35 years of their average income in order to save for a down payment. It's impossible. So, but you know, as we were talking, as, as, as Brian alluded to, we were talking for about an hour before this. It's interesting how government and regulation and bureaucracy is fundamentally has been the source of the problem, but yet, Ultimately, they, the government controls all of the levers of housing. And if there's the right vision and the right, um, essentially, understanding of how economics, finance, and housing works, it's not complicated. We could solve this. I believe we could solve this between five to eight years. It takes leadership and it takes pragmatism and it takes looking in the mirror and putting aside ideology, putting aside politics, and coming together as Canadians and say, look it, we have, we have been successful fighting back authoritarianism or totalitarianism in the Second World War. I think this is the biggest long-term challenge, short-term, immediate challenge that we face as Canadians. And it, it, we have to put aside all politics and ideology and come together. Because we're also facing, a, I'm also the chairman of a company called Zest Communities. Promerita has a large investment in Zest Communities. It's a life lease uh, model in Hamilton, Ontario. It's the largest seniors village in, in, in Hamilton. We have an aging population. If we don't get this right, the next 10 years will be very dark for this country.
can, can, so, I actually, can I actually jump in there? And yeah. I want to ask Jeff that, because I think what you've just alluded to, Ernest, is that there's a couple of things. A, we need to have places for people to live. Totally. But there's also, when you're doing that, you're actually looking to build a community. It's not simply a matter of putting up a series of, of floors where you can put houses in. And Jeff, maybe I can ask you, you know, Indwell, um, again, which you really should support and you should, uh, and you should look at, and Jeff's not paying me for that. Uh, um, it's, it's a wonderful organization. You talk about community housing, Jeff. So you, talk, you, you build buildings all the time. They're beautiful, they're, they're very effective, but you do more than just build buildings. You build actually a community and you actually create one. Can you talk a little bit about how housing and community interact and, and how your work does that? Yeah, thank you, Brian. And uh, Ernest, I, thanks for opening us up with that personal connection and, and the heart. And I think for most of us in the room, we have this nagging feeling in our stomach. Uh, to get into this building today, how many people did we walk past who um, are unhoused? And uh, that's a problem. And so I identify with your tears. It's completely unacceptable. And I appreciate them. Because I think that's the starting point. It's the starting point of we have to care. We have to have a set of values that says we as a society are only good as good as the least, as the least of us. And when we start in those root values that we take a community lens, not an individual lens, when we think about value, when we de-link a person's value, their humanity, humanity from uh, their economic contribution and rest it solely in their humanity, I think that's the starting point. From there, when we're working with people, there's a few things that we learned along the way, Brian, uh, around, um, well, so, sometimes I have to hear this from leaders a number of times to see it in practice, and see, to, 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 to actually grasp it. And I think about a um, civil rights leader in the States, uh, his name's John Perkins, and he says, you don't give people dignity, but you do have the opportunity to affirm the dignity that God has given them. So starting with that spot, so when we create buildings, we create, uh, they're efficient buildings, but they're beautiful buildings. And in the, the very architecture of our buildings, we say, you're a valuable human. And we start there. And people ask, they're like, well, um, how do you get your rent paid? And we say, well, we start with expectations that I trust you that you're gonna pay your rent. Even though it's a subsidized rent, it is rent. And guess what? Most people live up to expectations. And so you start with those spots and you affirm people's dignity and you create spaces that work, that are human, that are social, that are community oriented. So we talk about creating buildings in scale that are knowable sized communities so that people can be known known for their abilities, not just for their deficits. What are you good at is an amazing question to be asked, rather than tell me about the problems that I can solve for you. And when we get to do something that we're good at, right? We're doing that here today. We're talking about stuff that we feel like we know something about, and it feels, feels pretty good. And that basic humanity uh, coming out in architectural design. <clears throat> um, so thinking about where you place laundry rooms, how you connect people, um, flow of traffic. Uh, it, it, those things really matter to us, uh, common spaces. Um, when we d developed a, a building that was a former nightclub and strip club and rooming house in, in Hamilton, we've, we, that's now 10 years ago, we did some experiments with that. And we've, we've actually uh, developed um, quite a number of facilities like that. And um, the, the last one that I pur we purchased, I, I called my mother and I said, we bought another strip club. And she said, you certainly like those places, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and she's here today, so I had to add that one for, for her benefit. <clears throat> and, uh, but we do. We like to take stories of, of, of brokenness, of despair, and, and have a redemptive story through that. 
to say, you know what, there's a different way to live. Can I invite you into this space? I don't buy into the narrative that people want to be unhoused. And um, maybe that's the first question that, that sometimes gets asked, and if we can't imagine a preferred future, you might get that answer if you ask the gentleman laying in front of this building here today. But my experience has been when there's an alternate, and sometimes it takes a couple of weeks, we've found, to move someone from an encampment under a tarp into a housing unit. And there's a complexity of reasons for that, but it's possible. And I'll just open that up for, for a minute. For uh, In a town, a small town in southwestern Ontario called St. Thomas, um, the mayor took a different position and said, we're going to rebrand ourselves. Yes, economic development is very important for us, but we want to be known as the compassionate city. So what do we have? What can we put towards housing? And we're going to start with the premise that we want long-term permanent solutions for people that are sleeping under tarps in our ravines. We don't want to just save them from dying in, of the elements tonight, although that is good. We want to actually see people have transformation, permanent transformation and opportunity to thrive. And when they started with that spot, when they started looking at what they had, a remarkable thing happened. The city manager said, well, you know what? We got, a, we got a bunch of land that's not used to its highest and best use. And I'd love to co-opt that term. Actually, I think I'm going to do that right now. Go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I know where you're going with that. And they, they realized that they had a transit building that had a vacant second floor above it. So they put in 15 apartments with the help of the federal government and gave it to us to run. And two weeks ago, we took 15 people, the folks you're talking about, out of encampments into their own apartment. And that's the difference when we all find our spot to work together. That's the difference that, that, that's possible. So this idea that we don't know what to do, there's nothing that can be done, it's a false narrative. Don't buy into that. It starts with values, it starts with will, and it starts with what do we have? And I think we have to start with that. I have to start with that. What do I have to make a difference? Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, I actually want to pass it over to Graham because it's a perfect segue. What do we have? Graham, you talk about, um, with your work, the fact that uh, there's this community called the church in Canada, and it has a lot, both in terms of land, in terms of money. So maybe you can talk a little bit about your vision for that, what you see, um, and tell us a little bit about how, how we can take what we have to serve the, the people who are our flesh and blood as well. Thanks, Brian. So we, what we have is an inheritance, and Ernest spoke about... Um, being an orphan, and we know in the story of our scriptures the adoption as sons into God's story. We also know that Nehemiah's story began with tears before the king, and I think here we are in this newly minted eighth floor. Uh, we've heard two Nehemiahs bearing their tears before King Trudeau. <laughs> Actually, the king Nehemiah's king was not on God's people's side. He wasn't, he wasn't one of God's people. And whatever you think about our prime minister, he has resources that we don't have. Nehemiah had a city that was in ruins. We have a country that has so much blessing, but there are these ruins, and we're here to take time to talk about them. But we need other resources other than what we have, as well as the resources we have. I grew up uh, in Guelph, Ontario, and went to an Anglican school and a Presbyterian church. Uh, but it wasn't until I went to England and joined a church called Holy Trinity Brompton that I had a personal experience of giving my life to Christ. And when I came back to Canada, 14 years later, I had been ordained as a priest in the Church of England. I met my wife in England. We'd had uh, two of our three children there. And when I came back to Canada, I realized what an inheritance we have as the church. If you go up the road here to CRA's headquarters, they'll tell you the church in Canada has $18 billion worth of property. Um, if you ask Michael's team, they'll probably give you an answer closer to $60 billion. And if you add Catholic schools, you get up to around $80 billion. So it's, it's a pretty significant resource. Nehemiah had the city of Jerusalem. 
uh, we might look at the buildings that we have as congregations. You could go further and say, well, what wealth do we control as Christians? Um, how do we define Christians? Uh, you could say those who might, you know, I just define it as if you've been on an alpha course. you on an alpha <laughs> course, you're good. <laughs> if you haven't, <laughs> you should just sort that out. Um, but, you know, there are others where if you have your family grandparents kind of name on a stone in a big old 150-year-old church, maybe you're a Christian, right? So give the definition widely and say, what are we doing with that wealth? But that wealth is in the trillions, of course, right? And then if you look to all society, we are all invested in the property sector because we're all recipients uh, of the Canada Pension Plan. Maybe we're part of other pension or institutional funds that are all involved in this. When we look at the stock of assets that we control and what we're using, and I think that's where we wanted to go in today's panel, is how do we practically address the issues that have been brought up here? If you go to a typical, just close your eyes and imagine typical Canadian street corner, okay? The corner of Maine and Oxford in wherever, right? Can you picture it? What's on the street corner? Anglican, Presbyterian, United, Catholic, right? <laughs> Go out to the burbs and you've got something something community church with a much better parking lot. Um, and, uh, but nobody go, the, the, the boomers love to go there, the hipsters hate going there and the, that church is now trying to figure out what are we going to do to get back into the center of a city. We may have an evangelistic question about that. But when we go and ask the questions about housing or livability or community or the most vulnerable, we have to ask what are we doing with our land? The Reformation caused us to build more churches than we needed even at the time, and we built against each other. So there's a fundamental Reformation problem with the way we've built. We have an oversupply of church land. Now add the pandemic to that, you realize how many churches need as much square footage as they thought they needed, even less. I'm not gonna give you a number, but it's less than it was before. So there's an opportunity for consolidation. One of our bishops in the UK, he said this about an empty church. He said, an empty church is to its city like the empty palace of a long-forgotten king. We cannot do, folks, evangelism without dealing with the property assets of the church because we look too wasteful. If you go up to some of the other government departments here and say, we're really not interested in what you have to say, uh, honestly, but we're very interested in the assets you control. Well, I wouldn't agree with that, but there are some people who would say that. So the question really is, what are we going to do with the broken Jerusalem that we control? How are we going to go to sometimes the foreign king of our day? And how are we going to use the assets we have? With the Trinity Centers Foundation, our work is uh, working mainly with United Anglican Catholic Presbyterian congregations that are at the end. In Quebec City, there are 207 Roman Catholic churches. That has been reduced now down to 11 operating units. Okay. I've been on Brian's case, I haven't been on Michael's case yet about the French language uh, need for Cardis. C'était jamais plus que maintenant. On a besoin d'opérer en français ici à Cardis. It's essential. The future of the Canadian church can be seen more in Quebec than anywhere else. Amen? Amen. If you don't know that, come for a visit to Montreal. I'll explain what it's all about. But really, we need to look at what we're doing with these assets we need to understand that congregations, once they've reached a certain stage of decline, cannot operate in this level. I was saying to Ernest, and I think we kind of all agreed, a developer, a professional who deals with property, those are the only people who deal with property in that way. They are professional property people. You've got some here. They may go through 500 ideas for what's gonna happen on a property. A congregation, before they get to the right one, right? A congregation, after they've gone through three ideas for their property, are exhausted, uh, right? <laughs> there are way more people who've been on pro congregational property committees here than I, than I thought, right? We need to get serious about this, folks. That's why we're here today, to say this is a very important issue. We hold important resources. And actually, society is waiting to see what we're going to do in response. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, Michael, I'm actually going to go to you. You got something to say? I do. Michael's always got something to say. You go ahead and say what you're going to say. because That I was, was a ask rhetorical question. question. Yes. <laughs> so, so I opened with we've got a problem, we need more houses. And housing is fundamentally about dignity and, and emotional and social health. But as a policy issue, it touches literally everything else that we care about. So the 
last 10 years, if you look at where global GDP growth happened, and just kind of add it up, 85% of it happened in cities over a million people. The like, we have been moving to cities for thousands of years, and when we do that, we get more productive. Uh, people find new ways to express their kind of creative potential. And in a world where housing isn't affordable in our cities, we are restricting the benefits of our economic growth to the people who already have enough capital to be able to afford to live there. So just basic economic growth, we need to solve this problem. In Canada, we really value home ownership. We have one of the highest home ownership rates in the world. And what that means today for people in my generation is at the time that they are graduating, starting a career, forming a family, they're feeling overwhelming pressure to move towards buying a house. And what that generally means unless they have a large amount of down payment available to them from their family, is that they have to rip themselves out of the community that they are in, move much further out from the center, and at a time where they need more social and community support than they will need at any other point in their life, they are starting over socially. And that's before you get to the way we build creates the experience we have of our neighborhoods and our communities. And there was a joke in one of the videos, uh, what was the question, what is social architecture, which is a, a phrase Cardis really likes. Architecture, full stop, is fundamentally social. The way we build and organize the use of land creates our experience of community and neighborhood and society. It determines where we can work, the labor market we can participate in, the kinds of people we're going to have relationships with, the kinds of activities that we take part in. So there isn't like a part of our experience as a country that isn't shaped by this issue. So if we thought the stakes were high when we started, I thought I'd do a little bit to raise them. Did you have a question you wanted me to answer? <laughs> This is how all the conversations with Michael and I go. He opines, you wanted to ask me something? I actually want to pass it to Ernest. Ernest was wanted to get in here, and then we'll go to Jeff. Thanks, Brian. You know, one thing I wanted to mention, is before people get overwhelmed, hey, this problem's intractable because it sounds very complex, I want to say this is not about going to Mars. Because what's happened, if you look around the world, and to your... I'm trying to answer your original question. <laughs> um, there are a number of uh, places around this planet that have solved housing. Singapore is one of them. I would re regard Singapore as the best home ownership model you know, uh, in, in, on the planet. But there are rental models. For example, the, the uh, housing model in the city of Vienna is extremely successful and has been around for 50 odd years. And um, it's, a, it's a housing model that is concentrated in the city of Vienna, but supported by the country of Austria. Because everybody gets a small, small little tax to support uh, the, the housing program in Vienna. To Michael's point, they recognize this, people are moving to cities and the, the housing issue is, uh, affordability issue is the most challenging in a city, but it makes sense for a country to support the housing issue in, in the most expensive uh, part of the country. And there, even in the UK, uh, there are shared ownership models that have, we can basically, my point is we can learn, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we can learn from existing proven models, modify them for the Canadian context, and solve this. Jeff, do you, do you wanted to get in there, Jeff? I have a question for you oh, after, too. But yeah, you, it, you so, it. so there, there's, there's so much here. And, and Graham, I uh, wasn't expecting you to bring up Nehemiah, but the, this, this, his, there's things that we can learn, right, from these historical narratives. And, and the interesting part about that one is um, why did the king of Persia get all excited and not only let Nehemiah go, but said, like, along the way, take whatever resources that you need. Yeah. Why was he so excited about Jerusalem getting built? And you're right, it wasn't his people. 
It was, he needed more economic tax base. It wasn't just because he loved Nehemiah. He, he, needed, he needed Jerusalem to have a wall so that it could get to the business of productivity. And, and uh, so, in, and to, to your point uh, there, there, Michael, um, you know, housing, it, 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 if we don't solve this and solve it at all the different levels, this crisis will take, continue to take and to take over for us. And we won't be all that we can see in the humanity of people and our economy. So, you know, often I, I <laughs> said, it doesn't matter your starting point, whether it's the economy or whether it's people, um, we can come together here and, and, and realize that we need to do this for the good of our city, for the good of our, our, our people. And I just want to jump in on, on policy because uh, we can... It's, at this place, that sounds like a ridiculous idea. <laughs> so, so Go I, ahead, jump in on policy. So, so, so I th and I think we felt this in the, in the hour prior to this, the, I would say the, the first part of this conversation that you didn't get to listen to um, was, was about kind of struggling within the existing policy and, and, and looking for some changes for a different policy. And I think both actually have to happen. We need to figure out how do we work within the existing policy? And there's some really great stories right here. Can, can, I, can I pause you? Because I want to ask you a question that's going to launch Graham. And, and so let's talk policy for a minute. You have this thing called an impact loan, right? So Indwell, mm -hmm. Indwell uh, has an impact loan. Um, it's not, uh, you, can invest, you can invest your money in it. They give you a return. It's better return than a GIC, for instance. Um, uh, you, you should pay me. I'm just basically after that. Anyways, but, the, uh, but it's an impact loan. But what's interesting is that helps you on a spread that the, uh, for the commercial real estate mor mortgage that you're going to get. And if you win, we win, whatever, everybody wins. But it's not, it's not a product that actually you can buy as a registered fund or what have you. It strikes me that that's one example of a financial model that we could build or that needs to be built in the policy world that actually could help, help change the situation where people can invest their money. It's economic. Everybody mm -hmm. wins. There's a, um, there's a sense in which the government is getting something accomplished. They're leveraging the capital that Graham was talking about. So can you just maybe talk a bit about that? And then Graham, I would love you to talk about your understanding of how a REIT might work. How could that work with the government? That's the nitty gritty policy stuff. So quick there. because So then this, I want this is working it. within our existing policy, right? Exactly. So how do we thrive in that setting? And I've talked to many of you who are entrepreneurs here in the room. And um, uh, one of you said uh, you, you bet on, on the entrepreneur, and, and our team is a good team. Uh, so I'm a part of a, a phenomenal team of people who are committed to finding solutions. And I tell them nearly every day, success isn't the absence of challenges, it's the fortitude and the strength in which we overcome those challenges, because there's a lot of challenges. So one of the ways when... Um, uh, what did you call him, King Trudeau? Um, we, we, we <laughs> uh, uh, this is treasonous talk, by the way. Go on. But um, it, it, right now we have a, a wonderful piece of policy called the National Housing Strategy. If you read in our papers, the challenge of the National Housing Strategy is they can't get the money out the door. And so we needed to figure out what happens when the federal government says, you know what, we're going to help you and we're going to help cover 25% of your project. But then when it comes to writing the check, they can't figure out how to write the check. And not only have you had to buy the property, uh, clean it, uh, get it zoned, go through construction, have people living there, it's a, often six months to a year after occupancy when we get our construction money from the federal government. So, <clears throat> just over, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was just over here at the University of, of Ottawa um, uh, just before the, the, the pandemic and uh, CMHC had an innovation conference and they invited me to talk about innovation. I said, so the number one innovation you can do and there was people there who, you know, could make your refrigerator more innovative and, <laughs> uh, and I said, just, we know that you got a whole buildings full of bankers. They should know that if a, uh, good banking, when you sign a contract, you fulfill that contract. If you just start with fulfilling the contract that <laughs> you sign, that is the most innovative thing. So in response to that absence, 
And again, they're a wonderful partner. Uh, send us more money. Um, but uh, we, we had to get cash for our construction and for getting property. So we started um, reaching out and, and saying, um, uh, does anybody have any funds that they could lend us? And actually, uh, it was a... Uh, the very first person to line up had sold a chicken farm, and he goes, "Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, lend you three hundred thousand for that. How long do you need it?" And I said, "Well, they promised it's going to be paid out this week, so why don't you give me two weeks?" Uh, I had to go back to him at least ten times to extend that, <clears throat> um, and. Uh, that's where we started it, and it's grown to $30 million, uh, about uh, uh, about 200 people, uh, some churches. You know that uh, almost every nonprofit and charity has a reserve fund somewhere, and it's, it's often just sitting there actually shrinking because it's it's in GICs that are lower than inflation and they're not thinking about how you can use it. So some churches have been innovative and stuck their 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 reserve funds with us, but it's mostly individuals um, and uh, it's they're taking a risk with us. It's it's unsecured, it's super simple, it's a two-page personal loan agreement and we looked at alternatives. Um, and, and just keeping it super simple was the way to do it. Now we've outpaced that. Uh, we have uh, 160 million in projects under construction right now with another two to 300 million in the pipeline coming up. So 30 million isn't gonna do it. So this is where I'm super interested to hear what Graham's gonna yeah, say let's, next. Let's, pa let's pass it. So, but I, I did wanna point that out though, cause it's an example of you're running into trouble, the government's not paying its bills on time. You need some bridge funding. That's unleashing the capital there. That I think that capital could be unleashed yeah. even further. If, for instance, it was registered, you could you would not have to pay the taxes on that. But anyways, Graham, you've got yeah. lots of ideas on okay. this. Why don't you why don't you let so, her rip? So first of all, forgive me a little joke here. It might be in bad taste, but just go with me for a second. I had when I was well exactly. <laughs> You didn't, no, I'm not going to repeat it, but it was very really <laughs> funny. So when I was in London, we had a lot of friends working in finance and uh, quite a few of the large private equity companies. And when we were in their offices, like this kind of place, I would always say hello to the CIA because I figured they'd installed some microphones somewhere <laughs> listening to that. So I'm sure somebody in Ottawa is going to figure out how to put a microphone in this facility and listen in. So hello and, uh, <laughs> you know, bonjour, c'est nous. Uh, and so, um, but uh, I would just put a little nod here as we talk about financial structures to the various regulatory regimes that we have spoken about today. Um, we're all under charitable regulations, that has a restriction. Now we're talking about securities regulations and even just talking about the terms of an investment we're not allowed to do with unqualified investors and I'm not actually qualified to talk about um, selling them. So any potential, you know, Brian's saying I should be paid for this. We do have to be serious and say when we talk about these things, you need regulated professionals in the securities sector who talk about this fully. So we're just talking about ideas here. For sure. Okay? For sure. Uh, although I think Jeffrey's fund is a very good idea. <laughs> but it's not enough, right? Exactly. So, I mean, when you talk about ESG, if you're familiar with ESG, environment, social, and governance related investments, environment is all about COP26. We're living in it. Uh, the world is demanding. The CARDIS study detaching a younger generation from the older generation, we see at COP26, right? We see the system saying this is as far as we can go. We see younger generations saying that is not even close to sufficient, right? Social impact, we know about, but we don't know how to measure. Our measure that we're working on is exactly the same as what Jeffrey's working on and what Michael spoke about on affordability from the market rate. We're looking at that for other charities and nonprofits. So if a charity and nonprofit, we all benefit from the rise of the property sector. By all, I mean anybody who holds a pension in Canada. Um, we go up, as the property sector goes up, it becomes more and more expensive for charities and nonprofits to live. So exact same argument as we made for families, right? So we could measure actually affordability for helping charities occupy, for instance, an urban environment. We would have a social impact measure if we started doing that. There are others. On governance, um, we look at things in the wider sector like not putting prostitutes on a company uh, expense bill, right? That's what SNC-Lavalin did. Um, they got in trouble for it and they got called for it. And we, we're seeing some of those governance issues cleaned up. When people look at the church folks, they see some pretty severe governance issues. Uh, I noticed in the Cardis study there was 38 or 40 percent of serious distrust for evangelicals and Muslims, right? That's harm done. There's a lot of good done. We see that in Halo. 
there's actually harm, perceived harm that the church has done. Uh, if you look at the Catholic Church, there's a serious issue with residential schools right now, which is not resolved. And talk about a few people, two and a half million living in Metro Vancouver. The number, the actual number of people living um, on cardboard boxes, probably not that many when you look at the sheer number of the people. It's not an unsolvable problem. Right now, the Catholic Church owes $30 million on a settlement outstanding on the residential schools. That needs to be settled. Uh, the Anglican Church, United, Presbyterian, there are lots of responsibilities. I'm not saying that any one church is more responsible than another. But if you go where I'm going, the world is looking to ESG, and they're looking to us to follow into that phrase. Because if we do, we begin talking in the area that impact investing is going. This is the field of impact investing, to look at how these funds are using, uh, where they're actually placed. The way things work right now, and I'm again pointing at, uh, actually we can point at everybody here. When you put something into a publicly traded security or uh, many, there's many different securities regulations that will force a company to create the most efficient or highest return for its investors, right? You're familiar with this? In the real estate sector, you have to take a property and turn it to highest best use. When you think about Jeffrey having to operate with, I don't know if it's 30 million or something you mentioned as a, a pot of rotating capital, he can't get it out fast enough. There is no reason that we should not be putting, especially as Christians, but I, I think we can go broader than that and think of people who resonate with these kinds of messages. We should be creating purpose-driven funds to allow somebody like Jeffrey to do what he's doing. Amen? amen. If you want to say amen to that or whatever. Um, <laughs> Jeff is saying hallelujah. Here, here's, one, here's one final thing I'll say to, to, to root us back to Nehemiah. Um, those of you who laughed and maybe you were on the church building committee, how many, if, you're, if you're a pastor in the church and you're, you're putting a new extension on the building, it's Nehemiah all the way, right? They just, you're preaching him in, inside and out. Well, there's a problem. Nehemiah was not given those resources from the Persian king to go and rebuild the temple. And by, the well, by the way, not every church congregational building is, is the temple, right? Um, they're just nice places to meet. They're synagogues. Nehemiah went to rebuild the city walls. The city walls did provide defense, but even before they provided defense, you know what they were there for? They were the, the locus where contracts were agreed. These were mainly trade contracts. And for those of you who are involved in business, and we have I think somebody called us about Trinity Center's foundation. They said, and they said, I think you have all the best Christian lawyers in Canada on your board. And I thought, oh, maybe, we, maybe we do. Did you say that to me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have some of the best Christian accountants. And we had, we, had one, we had actually one Christian lawyer who wasn't on our team originally, and he called, and he was angry. And he, he demanded, he said, I demand to be on this Trinity Center's team. He said, I've been praying my entire life about how the concept of Jubilee should apply to Canada's mainline churches when they go bankrupt, right? How does land return to its original community? So we have people who are that smart and that much, have that much experience. For those of you who are agreeing contracts at the city gates, who are engaged in commerce, I think society, if you will, I would say the Lord, is expecting a higher standard of the business contracts that we agree. And when it comes to these kinds of things, I'm glad you got it done in two pages. But I think we probably are going to need some slightly longer contracts to make sure that we are leading the way. And guess what? Jesus led the way. He led it within a system. He, only, he broke several rules in a very key way. We know as serious thinkers and actors in the economy and society how to play by the rules and how to push them. And I think if I was to say one conclusion I hope you're taking from this is that we need to not be on the back foot of this push. We need to be on the front and see how these contracts can come together and how we can use our wealth practically to see this happen. So, you know, what if we create an investment fund to go and buy 100 United Churches? It's a tragedy when you see them falling apart. The, the city planner for the city of Peterborough, he called me, uh, he, I meet up at the Heritage, I go to all the Heritage uh, con you know, National Trust conferences. I think I'm going to become the first ordained person in Canada to hold the designation of a Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. I've got all my papers in for that. Anyways, one of these guys, he came and grabbed me. He said, Graham, what the hell are you doing? You told me you were going to get all those damn churches that are meeting out in those suburbs into all these downtown churches. 
but I've got seven bloody demolition orders on my desk. What are you doing? I said, what are you doing, Eric? You have the power to convene. You're the head of city planning. You can bring everybody together. He said, I wouldn't know what to say to them if, if I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for heaven's sake, Michael Van Pelt, you know, this is an opportunity for Cardis. We've been talking to Cardis about this. We should be convening that conversation. We should be there. And the investment structures that need to follow, what, what I really mean to say is we need to put our money where our mouths are. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over. I saw you champing at the bit there. Sorry, I went for Okay, we're, well, you know what we're gonna do here? We're at, uh, we're at 11.30, so we're at the end. So if you, Michael, are capable of being succinct, concise. <laughs> You go to the tape. I have been the most. Have it's true. That's true. Touche. We're gonna. We're gonna play. Identity comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I need. I need you to do a high density comment. We're gonna pass it. We're gonna give the last word to Ernest, and then I'm gonna close with something that has come up since. So high density speech. So so just what's missing, right? So in Canada, you can occupy a house one of two ways: fee simple ownership, some version of rented tenancy. There are lots of other ways that we could imagine making that work. You could have a lease that came with the right to invest in the property that you were living in. You could be a co-owner. You could do co-housing. People can, so the, the options for alternate tenure, there's a huge opportunity for innovation there. In the built environment, we build high-priced, high-density condominiums, and we build single-family homes. There is lots of room in between for townhouses, semi-detached, things that we've done in the past and we don't do anymore. And so this is not an intractable problem and it's not a problem that is, we have to create the solution out of thin air. What we have to do is we have to focus on it, we have to coordinate our resources, we have to convene, we have to design new institutions and structures that get us to where we need to go. And the church, is in a position to think both about the economics and the engineering and the boots on the ground problem, but also the values and what it means to have a community and a social experience that's gonna create the kind of society that we wanna have. So we're, we should be at the front of the line, we should get, everyone should have their hands on the wall, we should all be br building this together and Carta should be leading the way. Uh, yeah. that, that's just, High value, high density. That's good stuff right there. Ernest, I'm going to pass it to you. You can be the, the last word on, the, on this. So I'm, as I'm listening and I'm thinking about the history of Canada, the church historically has played a key role in some of the most important institutions of our civil society. Think about the hospitals and the educational institutions that the church was the leader in creating the, these structures. Our most essential social piece of infrastructure and economic infrastructure is housing. There is an opportunity to connect the dots for the church to play, play a leadership role, to connect the dots and solve housing in this country. It's also a way to really be salt and light in the society. Because, you know, as St. Francis of Sisi said, I come from a background where, uh, in terms of faith, I've, I've realized for many Canadians, proselytizing and rhetoric isn't particularly effective evangelism. But my experience working with UGM in the downtown east side, Meeting people's basic needs is the first step in developing a relationship where the evangelizing is much more successful. So I think, you know, as a church community, uh, we should be think, looking at ourselves in the mirror and thinking about the leadership and, the, and who are, how are we going to live out the mission of the church in today's context. And I think housing is actually a tremendous opportunity for the church community in Canada to play a leadership role. But it does require a different approach. Beautifully started, beautifully ended. Um, you may have noticed I was tapping on my phone. I wasn't looking at my text or checking my, uh, my Instagram feed. I was actually, was reminded of a poem. Um, and you're all, 
You knew that was coming. You knew that was coming. And you're all sick of me, but I'm actually going to read it. It's, it's an Alden Nolan poem that actually, when you talked about walking east out of your office, um, it, it just reminded me of this. And this is, a, this is a poem by Alden Nolan, and it's called Of Holy Men. So I'm just going to read it. Not every wino is a holy man. Oh, but some of them are. I love those who've learned to sit comfortably for long periods with their hams pressed against their calves outdoors, with a wall for a backrest contentedly saying nothing. These move about only when necessary, on foot and almost always in pairs. I think of them as oblates. Christ's blood is in their veins and they thirst for it. They have looked into the eyes of God, unprotected by smoked glass. I think of that every time I walk east, east here, and um, I just am so grateful to have a panel up here that understands that, that the person sitting there is somebody who is made in God's image, who bears his image unsmoked. Not, not, a, not, a, not a marred glass, but a glass that is actually God's image. And I'm really thankful that not only do you understand that, that's a heart, but that's at the heart of your work when it comes to policy, when it comes to economics, when it comes to building this country. And so if you join me, I'd like to thank these uh, gentlemen for this panel. No, we do. <laughs> I said at the beginning, don't lose the audience. They didn't lose the audience, so thanks so much. Um, I think we're done here. Um, I think it's time for us to have a little bit of lunch in terms of the hard work. Um, the day the work is over, I would really encourage you to stay, to chat with us, to continue to mingle about. The official program, however, is over, and so it's the unofficial time. Please enjoy this time, enjoy this space, and enjoy one another's company. And, and on behalf of Cardis and Michael and our board, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us. This has been a tremendous uh, three days. It's been life-giving to me. It's been life-giving to this organization. And I hope that you continue to walk alongside us as we, we move into the next 20 years of doing good public policy work here in Canada. So thank you. God bless you. And have a great weekend. Friends, we've been truly honored by your presence. Thank you for joining us from all over the world for this Cardis birthday celebration. We are so grateful for your patronage, for your attention, and for your support over these last three days and these last 20 years. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and God bless you.